Let's pray together. Lord, we, uh, we ask that you would speak to us now. We pray that you will uh, open our hearts to your word as we dive in and may we never be the same. And I pray, Lord, that we would be found faithful in all that you've called us to do. And especially in these days, these days of uh, challenging moments for us in a year that has been so challenging. And I pray that uh, you would speak into every heart that's watching uh, here in this room and really around the world. And we pray that we'll focus now as your spirit speaks to us. Lord, we are listening. And so we thank you for what you're gonna do in our hearts ahead of time. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Hey, we do welcome you. Uh, We're so glad. It's so good to worship together, isn't it? Our numbers continue to rise here on campus. Our attendance here is constantly growing, and that's a great thing. I don't know if that makes you nervous. Those of you watching online, we had uh, an overflow crowd, in fact, last week in the Great Hall, so we're adding some chairs. Uh, No doubt you heard the governor's... um, Uh, announcement regarding the mask and uh, met with our medical team again this week. Uh, We're going to share more about that as we move forward. You have an opportunity to join us on March the 28th. We're going to have a a town hall where I'm going to talk with our medical team, talk about steps forward and even cast some vision into the summer. And uh, we've got some great days ahead. Easter is coming and we're going to be on campus. Praise be to God. We were not last year, if you can believe that. But um, we'll continue to follow CDC guidelines and we're going to wear, wear masks. We're going to continue to do that, at least for the foreseeable future, to love our neighbors well as we have sought to, to do so. But that's uh, how we've been guided and counseled along the way. And so we're going to continue to do that. But listen in because I'm ready to be done with these masks. We probably will have a, I don't know, maybe, maybe a bonfire burning of the mask at some point would be a great thing. And uh, we'll all sing, yes. And we'll all, uh, we'll all sing praise to God. This past week, I had the opportunity to call one of our members. I'm on the phone a lot these days, just reaching out to people. I miss being together, though things are opening up a bit. But I called one of our members, Miss uh, Audrey Tweet. Tweed. Maybe you know Miss Tweed. She, uh, on Friday, called her on her birthday. I know I'm not supposed to do this, but you'll see why. I'm not supposed to tell you how old a woman is, but I think she wouldn't mind me telling you. She turned 100 years old on Friday. And so um, it was amazing. Yes, we can applaud her and the Lord for a, such a gift that she is to our church. She can't wait to get back, is my point. Uh, so once she's back, she's in the Mary Martha class, many of you know her, um, then you'll have no excuses. Okay, she's ready and she's been doing yard work and all kinds of things. And so she's ready to get back. And so there's coming a point where we're going to say, there are no more excuses. Come on back. Now, if you're a little, little nervous about coming back, we understand that. But the reason that we want to continue to wear a mask is so that everyone feels safe and comfortable. And we're doing that. So come back. We have a spacious sanctuary in particular um, with high, lofty ceilings. And, and you can come and worship uh, here with us. We'd love to have you come back. But I know that's a personal decision. You know, one of the great challenges throughout this pandemic has been that we've not only not been together as much, but um, we haven't been able to have meals together so much. Uh, Again, I think that's happening more and more as the days um, open up a bit, restaurants are opening up and that kind of thing. But I've missed that as much as anything. You, You think about having meals together. It's over meals that we talk about life. It's, it's a lot of the church takes place over meals. Uh, some of you uh, remember back in the day, how many remember covered dish suppers? Remember this? Like, did everybody bring a casserole? Um, how many of you, Baptist, I'm wondering, growing up, Baptist, okay, because we were like renowned. We, we dominated, you know, when it came to the, to the covered dish suppers, right? We ruled uh, over all denominations, and we were kind of known for that. And, of course, our, our waistlines kind of proved that we were winning. Um, but, you know, meal time has always been uh, a time of worship and, and an incredible time. We're going to talk about eating today. And uh, I don't know about you. I want, I want you to kind of think with me. Your memories growing up at the table. We all have different memories of what it was like to be at the table. I have two brothers. I'm in the middle of two. And so mom and dad there. And, and I have fond memories of growing up in our home eating meals together. I remember, uh, you know, mom probably saying, you know, dad, four on the floor, you know, keeping your chair on the floor. I remember you could eat everything on your plate. You become a member of the clean plate club. That was the thing. And uh, I remember just conversations around the table and 
uh, just sweet times. I was always a slower eater and my mom and I would always end up at the table. Everybody's gone. Uh, at some point, we'd be there just the two of us together. But you know, American mealtimes have, have changed dramatically. There's a thing that took place in the 50s, you know, and it, before I was born, even into the 60s, where uh, a phenomenon that took place that changed American meals for the family forever. They were called fast food chains. Uh, not, not, not necessarily good food and certainly not healthy food, but fast food because the American family was on the move. And then it was some, sometime around the 70s where this thing called the microwave was entered uh, into the picture where every person in the family could zap their own food, eat it and be on the run because we just got to keep moving. And even still meals are something now that we just fit into our schedule. Now, some of you may say, well, that's not how I eat. I mean, I'm, I'm taking my time and I'm eating. You realize that even with our kind of speed meals that we rush through these days, you're going to spend about 68 minutes today on average um, eating, eating food. 32,000 hours in your lifetime. Listen, three and a half years of your life, you're going to eat. And so it begs the question, if we're going to, everything that we do is to bring glory to God. Have you ever thought about it? How do you bring glory to God with your eating and your drinking? Even Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink and whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Eating and drinking is a big deal in the kingdom. And it is an opportunity for us, right? To connect, to share the day, to share our hearts and do life together. We've talked about focusing in on people as we seek to bless others in these days. Last week, we talked about listening. Think about it. Where else in culture do you sit down with someone across a table, knee to knee, toe to toe, eyeball to eyeball, heart to heart for an extended period of time? And sharing, communing, if you will, in a meal together, that happens nowhere else, really. It may happen at a coffee shop or just to sit down, let's talk for a bit. It's a powerful moment. And the Lord has much to say to us about eating. And we're going to look at that today. I don't know if you've ever heard a sermon about eating. Jesus liked to eat. And so again, that's a good thing. Eat like Jesus. Uh, Some years ago, there was a book came out. Not not what would Jesus do, but what would Jesus eat? And even a cookbook. Like you could eat what he ate. I guess like the super diet or something. I'm not concerned about what he ate so much, but how he ate with others. And today we're going to offer up a kind of three course meal. Uh, that Jesus is going to bring to us in this passage we're looking at in the book of Luke. Luke 7, you can go ahead and turn there, if you will. If you have your Bible at home, grab it right here in the room. Luke chapter 7, one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture right here. How can our mealtimes become a blessing to others? How can we slow down a bit? How can we serve up what Jesus would serve up at a meal? And today we're going to learn that he's serving up grace. He's serving up truth and he's serving up forgiveness. So we're going to eat like Jesus. Some of you ever thought about this much. The incarnate Christ, he ate. The risen Christ ate. There's coming a day when we'll eat with him again. Evidently eating is a big deal. Here in Luke, place it in context, there are 10 stories of Jesus eating with various people throughout the book of Luke. And here we find him again at another, uh, another uh, at a Pharisee's home. This is really an unusual setting here for him. He's invited to a Pharisee's home, which is an act of grace in itself for him to uh, say, yes, I'll, I'll be there. Jesus, by this point, is quite the controversial figure. Uh, he's been teaching and healing. John the Baptist, just prior to this, you can see he's, he's in prison. Uh, Jesus is creating quite a stir, especially among the religious elite represented by the Pharisees. And in Luke 7, here he is invited to the Pharisees' house. And I want you to see, as, he, as Jesus will show us, at your table, if you're taking notes, at your table, let's serve, serve grace. Watch this, in verse uh, 36, at your table, serve grace. Verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And we're going to discover later, his name is Simon. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, we don't know why uh, he invited Jesus to come. But I think we'll gain insight into the, as the conversation proceeds as to why. Uh, his motives are 
are pretty clear, I think. You, you may know that the Pharisees were a legalistic group. This is important to understand in this, in this story. They're a religious group. They're, they're known for their self-righteousness and they were not friends of Jesus. And it's gonna become more and more uh, this way as his ministry goes. Uh, they labeled him a friend of sinners because they were the righteous, the Pharisees and the good Jew. And then there were the sinners, And they said, you are a friend of sinners. You run with sinners. And they said that precisely because he ate with them, among other things. But they would say, you eat with sinners. They would call him out. But don't miss this. Jesus loves the sinner. But as we're going to see here, he loves the Pharisee as well. This is an act of grace on his part to be there. And sometimes there's a kind of reverse discrimination, if you will. Well, I understand grace. I'm a person of grace. They're legalists. We, you know, as if then we flip the tables. and We become the very thing that we don't want to become legalistic in regard to our grace. And yet the Pharisees here, they are uh, self-righteous and, and they didn't quite understand this message of grace as we'll see here. But we can tell uh, that Jesus had friends with the religious and the irreligious and he loved all people. We can do the same. I wonder at your table, do you find yourself at the table with those who are irreligious, non-Christians and and, and yes, with Christians. How about those who think they're super Christians? You find yourself with all kinds of people. Who's at your table? the city. Now we don't know that explicitly, but she was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table, now consider this, uh, you come to a table, you don't sit at chairs, you, 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 you recline, you lie down. It's almost like the, the, the person is leaning toward the table, all the people, and then spokes going out, their feet are going out around the table. This will be important to have in your mind as the story goes on. He was reclining at the table at the Pharisee's house, brought in, uh, while, while, while he's there, this woman seems to burst in. She's not on the guest list. She would not have been invited to this meal. So listen, she has heard Jesus. She knows about Jesus. And we're going to see, she knows about his message of grace. And so she comes in, she brought an alabaster flask, which was this really expensive ointment, a flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet. So then she starts to lean down and maybe get on her knees and she's with tears, she's wiped wiped them with the hair on her head and she kissed his feet. She's anointing them with ointment. And this this is just an amazing moment. This woman barges in. Think about this. She's an ostracized sinner. She's been labeled all of her life. She's unwanted, she's disregarded. And, and those who seem to be close to God are just constantly disregarding her. And then she hears this message of grace and it changes her life. I've been to places where people have never heard the gospel. I've had friends who have never grasped the gospel of grace, free grace offered us in Jesus. And it is overwhelming. And, and, and you can maybe remember a time where it's been for you or has it been that way today? This woman just burst in and she's weeping because the grace of God has so changed her life. And this is worth thinking about today. I I was challenged by this this week. Do I burst in? Do I enter in? I came to worship this morning with a different posture. I'd like to think I'm always expectant, always ready. But did you come in? Are you here to say, yes, I've got to get to Jesus. And I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm gonna worship him extravagantly. I'm going to worship him with all that I've got. Because ironically, the woman, not the religious man, the woman shows us what true worship really is. She's given everything she has. She must find him. And again, I was, I was challenged by this. But see, here at the table with Jesus, there's grace. There is grace for the legalist and there's grace for the sinner. There's grace for us all. She offers um, all that, that, uh, that Simon didn't offer. You may know the context here. The, the common courtesies uh, required by a host in the Middle Eastern culture was such and still is such in many ways. He would have greeted him at the door. He would have given him uh, a kiss on the cheek. 
He, he would have uh, uh, you know, given him uh, some, some water to wash his hands, certainly, and wash his feet. They would often put um, some kind of ointment or perfume even in, uh, in the water so that your feet smelled better than they did and you, you, you smelled so good. And so he didn't offer any of that. Jesus had every right to say to him in this culture, I'm not welcome here. I am offended greatly. I'm out. I mean, he's saying, uh, you know, he's done nothing for him. And then this woman comes in and she goes over the top with all of it. You see what's happening here? And so she comes in because grace has changed her life. You know, even in our corporate gatherings, um, I've thought about this. Do, do, we, do we respond to the Lord as we should? You know, some of us, I, I heard a story this morning, and I've heard this a couple of times, folks coming back to worship for the first time in a year and just weeping. Just during a song, just, I, just I've missed this. I've missed the family of God. And I heard uh, stories of people just so overwhelmed. And I just want, to, I want you to know all emotions are allowed in worship. If you come before God, and even today, I found myself in tears and a moment of worship, just, yes, you've been so good to me. You've been so good to me. Sometimes you want to just maybe be silent. and Let others sing over you. Maybe you want others to proclaim the fate that you wish you had on a given Sunday. Maybe you want to raise your hands. You want to applaud. You want to just shout to him and say, yes, you're so good to me. All emotions are allowed. And here this woman is bringing everything she's got in extravagant worship. And Simon and the others can't believe it. Look at verse 39. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this, this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. You see what's happening? He can't believe. He's thinking Jesus doesn't, he's not a prophet. He doesn't know anything about this woman. But what's his problem? What is Simon's problem, really? In a word, it's pride. See, Simon is so filled with pride. He's blind to everything going on. And he's reading every person in the room wrongly. He doesn't know that Jesus is actually the Messiah. Who's going to read his mind in a moment, by the way. He's thinking he doesn't know what he's thinking. He, he thinks the woman is a sinner far from God when she is right there worshiping him. And he's got a wrong view of himself as well. He thinks he's in the right. His pride has blinded him to everyone. Clearly the worst sin at the table is not prostitution. It's pride among the religious elite. This should cause us to pause and think about ourselves. He's thinking she doesn't, she, he, she's the worst sinner I know. I would never have her in my house. But listen friends, if you're not the worst sinner you know, you don't know yourself very well. Because you know all the deep, dark thoughts and things that you have thought in your life. The things that you have done that others don't know. But the beauty of the gospel is that we can recognize our personal depravity and God's unending grace extended to us. Those who have not grasped the gospel fully and deeply will always be condemning, always condescending insecure, even angry. Simon's angry that Jesus has extended this grace to this woman. So what's going on at your table? Who's invited to join in? Is everyone welcome at your table? Are, are, are all finding a place at your table, a place of grace? You know, Stacy and I, um, We've made a lot of mistakes as parents, but I would give us pretty high marks when it comes to uh, the mealtime. Throughout our, our kids growing up, we, we regularly intentionally had a meal, even as a pastor, often meetings or, or something that would come up, but we really tried to keep a, a powerful rhythm of, of time with the family. You think about this, like any pattern in your life, you know, exercise or anything else, you, you enter into this pattern of having meals together of catching up with each other, of talking about what's happening in your life, affirming each other, encouraging you. You do that enough over the course of time, it'll change your life. But I remember too growing up, the kids, or the kids growing up, we had twins at first, many of you know, and I remember mealtime became one of the most dangerous times for us. 
I mean, we, like, you know, there were times when the girls were little in their little high chairs. I remember Whitney kicking the table and her, her high chair just bam on the floor. We were at a restaurant one time and that happened. We thought we were going to end up at the hospital. I mean, it was scary. And then they get older and they're falling out of the chairs and all this kind of stuff. I mean, mealtimes can be crazy. Maybe for you, mealtimes, your memories were not of calm, precious, gracious, hospitable times at all. Maybe they're very difficult meals. Meals can be difficult. This one's going to get difficult here in a moment. Perhaps mealtimes are formative for you, but for all the wrong reasons. It was a place where there were outbursts of anger or interrupted with disagreements and arguments you felt put down. Maybe there was such anger or alcohol or abuse of some substance. That's what you remember. Maybe you feared moments at the table. I say that because we all can find grace at the table and we now can extend grace to others even if we didn't receive it ourselves. What are you serving at your table? Perhaps the most incredible thing about this passage is the effect that grace has on people's perspective. Simon the legalist is angry that this woman has received grace and in contrast, she comes with a broken, contrite spirit and she's overwhelmed by the grace of God, the religious and the irreligious. The so-called righteous and the sinner. You see, the woman comes before Jesus and, and they all are coming to the table and she's stuck between her past and her future. And Jesus sees her not who she has been, but who she can become. This is a powerful word for all of us. Are you seeing people at your table? Are you seeing people in your life? Not because of all they've done or who they've been, but because of who they can become in Christ. This changes everything. Because every one of us, look at this, she is there between her past and her future encountering Jesus. Simon is there between his past and his future encountering Jesus. But they receive this message of grace in completely different ways. One changes their life forever. We're gonna see with Simon it does not. At least in this moment, it doesn't. Because he has built his past on his own self-righteousness. And he cannot break away from it. Her past is filled with sin and she wants rescue. She finds it in Jesus. Her life is forever changed. Every person that sits before you at the table is in between their past and their future. Will they be met with grace when they encounter you? Will you point them to Jesus Because you see, in Christ, the judgment for our sin has shifted from the future to the past. He has taken on our sin so that we can be set free and we can look and see others in the same way, who they are becoming, not who they have been. The table is a place of grace. This woman, she offers radical hospitality to Jesus and and so I'm I'm challenging us all are you serving up grace and 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 now what I want you to see the next thing we're going to serve up kind of a three-course meal again the next one is we're going to serve truth look at verse 40 we're going to serve up truth okay because Simon has just thought uh if he if he was truly a prophet he would discern that this woman's a sinner notice that Simon thought this ironically Jesus is going to answer his thoughts in verse 40 He says, and Jesus answering him, said to him, answering. He didn't say anything. He's answering him, knowing what he's thinking. Simon, I have something to say to you. Now, this usually goes sideways. Jesus says this to you, by the way. And it's about to go down for Simon. And he answered, "Uh, say it, teacher. I'm all ears, rabbi. Jesus answers his thoughts. And he says, look at verse 41. Like he often does. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50 When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. So neither could pay. He canceled the debt on both. Now, which of them will, look at this, love him more? Which one will love him more? Now, a denarius, you might know, is about a day's wage. So we're talking about two years of income up against about three months. Let's say it's it's $100,000 up against $10,000. But neither can pay it back. And so then he asked him, Simon, Uh, You know, which one will love him more? Simon answered, 
The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Did he grasp in the moment? I'm talking about you and I'm talking about her. I think he did. And I think there's, here's the word for us. We, if we are to rightly understand God's grace, we must embrace the truth about the debt of our sin. Every single one of us. And, and, and as Jesus is talking about these two, neither could pay the debt back. And what we're seeing here, Jesus now is revealing two opposite sides of morality. Simon saw himself as highly moral. The woman was known to be highly immoral. Jesus says, neither can pay the debt and both need to be forgiven. This is profound and at the heart of the gospel. See, there are two ways to avoid Jesus in your life. One is to run your own life, you know, go at it, live a life of licentiousness and just live your life. The other is to keep all the rules, believing that somehow you are gaining points with God in your self-righteousness. Both are a means towards self-salvation. Tim Keller in his book, you may have read, if you haven't, you should, called The Prodigal God, notes that, uh, that the prodigal son story, the prodigal son story really is about the older brother. It's all about the older brother. And, and I was marked by this because this, this story lands the same way. And Keller says this, you can avoid Jesus as savior by keeping all the moral laws. If you do that, then you have rights. God owes you answered prayers and a good life and a ticket to heaven when you die. You don't need a savior who pardons you by free grace for you are your own savior. I think sometimes I slip into that as a Christian, right? God, I'm doing this all for you. <laughs> right? We can, we can fall there. I, I'm, 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 I mean, I'm, and we can get self-righteous. They don't get it, but I do. Instead of seeking to love people. See, this is what we see in Simon the Pharisee. Look at verse 44. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? As if Simon wasn't even looking at her. Would not even lock eyes with her. I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Simon had seen her maybe with his eyes, but he didn't see her with grace, not by any means. Look at verse 45. You gave me no kiss from the time I came in. She'd not stopped. She hadn't ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. See, the woman offered Jesus this radical hospitality as an act of worship. Our meals can be an incredible moment of grace to others. I mean, and I'm not talking about necessarily going over the top, but you know, you see all these tablescapes and all this kind of stuff. You can tell if you show up someone's house or at a table, even for lunch with somebody, you can tell if you are truly welcome or not, honored, graced. Jesus says, Simon, you did none of these things. He's speaking some hard truth across the table to Simon. He commends the woman, but notice he also says, her sins are many. I'm not disregarding that. She needs grace. But here we see now two responses to grace and truth. And Jesus just proclaims a new identity on this woman. Watch this. Look at verse 47 where he says, Therefore I tell you her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he was forgiven little, loves little. Now that is to say, if you don't recognize or embrace your, your depravity and your sin, then you... You're not going to understand the grace offered to you. This woman did. And, and here he proclaims a new identity on her. She, he's saying, you're now forgiven. You're, you're now forgiven. Watch this. Simon and the woman both found their identity in what they had done in the past. Simon had found it in his righteous deeds. He was better than everyone else. He's, 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 he's prejudiced. He's, he's, he's judgmental. The woman had found her worth in her past sins and all that she had done each had consumed 
something that then they said, this is who I am, right? Because you are what you eat. Think about that. We derive a lot of our identity from what we consume. What are you consuming these days? And I don't mean just food. It's interesting. In our day, we find our identity in what we eat. Literally, some people, I am vegan, right? I'm, I'm vegetarian. Uh, I'm gluten-free. We don't say I eat gluten-free. I am gluten-free. I am a vegetarian, you know. And, and so what happens is we, we identify in the same way. We identify or, or find ourselves defined by what we are consuming. Are you consuming the truth of God in your life? in these days are you in his word daily because if you're not I'm sure you're consuming a lot of other information that's coming at you that is forming and shaping your worldview in every way are you in his word are you pursuing him in prayer are you communing with him and so how do we serve up truth in our lives with other people well we talk about the word of God I think there's two things there, there's willingness and and there's there's timing as we commune with others, as we eat with others, we've got to be willing to share truth. And sometimes it's hard truth. But it's truth that we know because we're in God's word. And it's his word and it changes lives. So we've got to be willing to speak the truth. But we also have to be mindful of timing. It always comes in, uh, in and I think best, out of relationship. It's kind of like eating broccoli or spinach it's it's healthy for you but but it's hard to eat sometimes and we need to give it to others in the same way so watch this he's he serves up grace he serves up truth but like any any good meal you got to have dessert and finally we'll close with this he serves up forgiveness and that's what he's called us to do Jesus turns his attention to her and look at verse 48. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? In other words, who does he think he is? Only God can forgive sins. And then in verse 50, and he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Notice in the context of the conversation, your faith has saved, not your works. Simon, your faith has saved you. Watch this, friends. This is amazing. She is the believer. I mean, in our context, she's the believer in the story. He is the unbeliever. He's the non-believer. Oh, he's religious. He's righteous, thinking that he's going to get to God somehow by his good works. She's the one that's saved, not Simon. Simon. And we've got to find ourselves in this story or how we lean, even as believers. Yes, we've received the grace of God, many of us, but, but we can still lean that way. See, religion is the biggest barrier that people have in coming to God. And so now Jesus comes to us and I, I would ask you the question now, have you come to a point where God would say to you, your faith has saved you? Your faith has saved you, go in peace. Have you received the grace of God? Because listen, friends, all of history is heading towards another meal. Because in Christ, in this forgiveness, we find hope. Hope for the future. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in Revelation 19, describe people from all over the world, join the 24 elders and the four living creatures and all the heavenly realm. Everybody is there proclaiming together. It says great and small. It says in Revelation 19, seven, let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made her ready, made herself ready. We have been made ready by the grace of God. And if you have received his grace, you've received his truth that has changed your life, you've been forgiven, then you enter into this moment of worship. We're going to worship him without restraint, worship him without mask, worship him without sin in our lives. And today is a day where we get to enter into what is a preview. It's like a rehearsal dinner towards the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, 9, it says, And the angel said to me, Write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. It's an invitation, friends, for us to come. You're invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because in, in Matthew 26, 
Jesus is there. You know this other meal, the last meal that he would have with his disciples. It's the Passover meal. And watch what he does. He takes elements of the Lord's Supper, or how about this, the Passover meal, the old covenant, and he shifts them to the new covenant. There was the covenant of the law. There's now the covenant of grace, represented by Simon, represented by the woman, and we find ourselves there, and Jesus invites us to the table. And he says, come, come. And in so doing, he, he, as he does all the way off into Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. This is a picture of intimacy with Jesus. Eyeball to eyeball, toe to toe, heart to heart, across the table, every moment of your life to walk with him. Because he's invited you in to this beautiful meal with him. The meal of grace, the meal of truth, the meal of forgiveness. And now we're gonna partake of the Lord's Supper before we go. I want us to pray. Lord, we now give our hearts and our lives to you. We come now before the holy table, what your church has done for 2,000 years. And we will do it until you come again and then we will celebrate with you the marriage supper of the Lamb. So Lord, we give our hearts to you now. In your name we pray, amen.